But my class tonight is on our Christian family, the church. And um, I tell this story that um, several years ago, probably 15 years ago now, uh, one of my f first cousins removed, once removed in uh, New Jersey, whose ancestry is Nova Scotia on my father's side, um, her father had sent her to uh, college in Scotland because he wanted her to experience the family roots in the sense of the Scottish ancestry. And while she was in Scotland, she met a young man in college and they fell in love, they got engaged, and they asked me to do their wedding in New Jersey, where she's from. So uh, the Scottish uh, uh, fiance obviously moved to the United States and, and I did the wedding for them, as I mentioned, 15 years ago. But anyway, I was asking him about uh, Scotland and he lived in Edinburgh, which is one of the major cities of Scotland, and I asked him, well, which, and he's, he was a Catholic, and I asked him, what church did he attend in Scotland? And he said, well, I actually attend uh, the cathedral there. And then he asked me about my parish, and at that time I was a pastor of Most Holy Trinity in Augusta. And uh, if you know anything about the state of Georgia and Catholicism in the state of Georgia, the Church of the Most Holy Trinity is one of the oldest Catholic churches in the state of Georgia. Uh, in fact, the church building uh, is the oldest uh, Catholic church building in the state of Georgia. It was uh, built, and I'm telling him this, as what I'm telling you now is what I was telling him, uh, that it was begun in 1857, uh, the foundation was laid and totally completed and paid for and consecrated in 1863, but that the parish had gone back to actually 1810. In fact, this year they're celebrating their 200th anniversary as, on that site as a parish. Uh, so I was going on and, on and on about the history of this parish. Then I asked him, and, and the cathedral there, uh, um, how old is it? Well, he says, I think it's about a thousand years old. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> so, so you think mine's just a modern new church, right? Okay, so, uh, so but, but that tells you something about the antiquity of Catholicism, especially in the old country, if you will, in, in Europe and in the Middle East where, where the church actually began. Because um, the church does have, the Catholic church does have a 2,000 year history. And all things have a beginning, and when you look at the Catholic church or the church in general, uh, its beginning technically should be described as when Jesus Christ began his public ministry and uh, began to call people to follow him. So you can see the beginnings of the church, although it wasn't fully established as a hierarchical church at that point, uh, or organized in any fashion, and nor were the sacraments being celebrated because there was a need for it at that point. The beginnings of the church really start uh, at the ministry or the public ministry of Jesus Christ. But there are some in the Catholic Church who would say that the beginning of the church actually was when the Blessed Virgin Mary was conceived in the, mother, in the womb of her mother. Because the Blessed Virgin Mary becomes a tabernacle at the Annunciation of our Lord, and we can say that that, in fact, uh, through Mary, she is a symbol of the church. And so we could say that the church really had its beginnings uh, at that point. But most Catholic scholars would say that the Catholic Church actually began on Pentecost Sunday, when the 11 apostles, along with the Blessed Virgin Mary, were up in the upper room, kind of confused and befuddled by the fact that Jesus had uh, been crucified and, <clears throat> and risen from the dead and ascended. And the Holy Spirit came upon them that removed any fear and anxiety that they had and so in, inspired them to go out into the world and to proclaim the good news that whoever they spoke the message of the gospel to understood it in their own native language. And so we would say really the birthday of the church, if you really want to get technical, is the Pentecost event. So the Catholic Church goes all the way back to Jesus Christ uh, gathering a community together and then forming that community and then giving that community the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, at Pentecost. Now, one of the things that we have to understand about the church at its very beginning is that it was a part of the Jewish religion. 
Okay, to begin with, the Catholic Church was Jewish. This is most important for us to understand, and was like, I would say, almost like a denomination of Judaism, or a branch of Judaism. Uh, they, primarily the first Christians were Jews who recognized in Jesus that he was the long-awaited Messiah, and after his death and resurrection, or even prior to it, they were following him, but after the, his death and resurrection, they were the ones that began to form the hierarchical church. First, which we'll get into in a minute, with uh, the apostles themselves and the various communities that they formed, where people were baptized, uh, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and celebrated the Holy Eucharist. So they, they were Jewish converts to Christianity, but Christianity at that point was still a part of Judaism. Uh, just a, another branch. You know, today if you look at Judaism, there's liberal, reformed, orthodox, there's different branches within Judaism just as there are now in uh, Christianity. So uh, Christianity was seen uh, by the Jewish uh, converts as just an extension of their Judaism. Okay? And this occurred for probably the first hundred years, which is a rather long time when you stop and think about it. Uh, but eventually what occurred uh, is uh, this debate that was in the church, the early church, con concerning St. Paul, who ordinarily would be rather conservative, but uh, in this particular issue uh, was not conservative. What do you think was the greatest stumbling block to non-Jews? Well, let me, before I ask you this question. In this 100-year period, when it was still part of Judaism, in order to become a Christian, you had to first become a Jew, if you were not a Jew. Okay? So the church was receiving non-Jews into Christianity, but they had to first become Jews, okay? and then become Christian. But they weren't having a great deal of success. Uh, and can anybody tell me why there was not a great deal of success? Circumcision. circumcision. The men, the adult men, who were pagans, had to be circumcised uh, in order to become Jewish and then Christian. And that created a big controversy in the, in the church because some of the apostles and other members of the church said, we're losing an opportunity to gain converts because the adult men don't want to be circumcised. And can you blame them? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and in that time, you know, they didn't have the uh, anesthesia and, uh, you know, you know, it was, a, it was, a, <laughs> right, right. It, it was a dull swift knife, a knife, you know, so that, that all of that was, you know, it just was not good. So a lot of people were not coming into the church. So St. Paul kind of spearheaded the movement to say that for people to become Christians, they no longer had to become Jewish, which meant that for men they didn't have to be um, uh, circumcised. Okay, and after a while, Saint Paul's point of view won out, and that was a turning point where, after this period of time of a hundred years, where the primary converts to Catholicism were Jews. Then, after St. Paul relaxed how you could become a Christian, the majority of people becoming Christians were pagans, not Jews. Okay? And by the time the church is primarily pagan converts, or non-Gentile converts, uh, might be a better term, then it begins to separate from Judaism. But that took about a hundred years to occur. Okay? So I always say, and the Pope agrees with me, <laughs> no, uh, actually the Pope says this, uh, that, that um, our Jewish, our Jews are our elder brothers and sisters in the faith. And so even though there has been a history of anti-Semitism within Catholicism or members of the Catholic Church, uh, really that's unfortunate because, you know, Christ was a Jew, Mary was, and the early church was Jewish uh, uh, for the first hundred years, so we should not have an animosity towards them. So once uh, uh, it became separate, uh, um, then the church, from, from Judaism, the church really did spread uh, throughout uh, uh, the Gentile world. 
Now, for the first 300 years of the church, things were rather difficult because, especially as it traveled into Europe, uh, the church, the, the apostles brought the church to Europe and other uh, diverse locations throughout the world, the known world at that time. Um, it met with persecution from the Jews who didn't understand that Christianity was the fulfillment of their expectations, and from pagans who saw uh, Christianity as sub subversive to pagan religion and to the uh, worship that the emperors thought that they deserved. And so for the first 300 years, the church kind of had to live in the catacombs and worship in the catacombs and live in hiding. So that all changed in the year 300 when Constantine, the emperor of the Roman, great Roman Empire, converted to the Catholic faith and then allowed Catholicism to come out of the catacombs and to become the, the religion of the state. And at that point, Catholicism starts to borrow many of the accoutrements of of the uh, court of the Roman Empire in terms of vesture for priests, in terms of governance, uh, laws, um, worship, the use of incense, uh, and more of a visual expression of our Catholic Mass. They moved into great pagan temples that were basilica-like, and that meant a grander form of worship, similar to what we have now, uh, maybe more so than what we have here at St. Joseph's. So for the first thousand years of the church history, and there's a little bit of a, uh, of a guide here for you in terms of when things occurred year-wise. Uh, you can see uh, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church kind of bopped along pretty well for the first 1,000 years. Now there were various councils that were called to address heresies in the church. Was Jesus a divine person? Or was he just merely a human person? There were controversies and vicious fights on either side. What did it mean that he was one divine person with two natures, human and divine? People had various thoughts, and there were all kinds of weird ideas. So in this 1,000-year period, the church had to call official councils of the church, the bishops together, to address these controversies and to make definitive statements. So I don't want to make it sound like for the first 1,000 years, Everybody was harmonious and on the same page, and there were no issues whatsoever. There were, and there were fights, and there were splinter groups, but the church remained one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, until the first major division within Christianity, which occurred in the year 1095, and that's called the Great Schism. Now, in the Great Schism, the Eastern Church, which would be the church, let's say, of uh, beginning with Turkey and eastward towards uh, the, the Middle East, Iraq, uh, uh, and other areas like that, broke away from the Catholic Church that was based in Rome. The Eastern Church was based in Constantinople, which is now uh, uh, Istanbul. And uh, the Western Church was based in Rome. And both understood each other's prominence but the Eastern Church, prior to the Great Schism, acknowledged the Pope as the head of the Church. But they always had some issues with that, because, they're, uh, because of the sin of pride. But anyway, um, by the time 1054, or, or yeah, 1054 came about the Great Schism, I'm sorry, not 1095, then Orthodoxy went its own way, and the Catholic Church went off on a different uh, trajectory. Um, and you, this, this will tell you some of the things that occurred. So orthodoxy has its own peculiar history all the way up until this day. But the reason they call themselves orthodox is that they believe in right teaching, correct practice of the faith, which is what orthodoxy means. And so they've always relied upon these first councils of the church up until the Great Schism to guide them. And they didn't have uh, any other councils uh, after this whereas the Catholic Church did, okay? And so the councils that occurred in the Catholic Church after the Great Schism, the Orthodox, for the most part, do not acknowledge them as, uh, as truly ecumen ecumenical councils. But they have the same sacraments, the same priesthood, and we were one at one time. And even in the break, they did not lose the sacraments or the priesthood or anything. They in fact, they kind of really redefined in a positive way what those were. The next major break, not in orthodoxy, but in the Catholic Church, occurred 
uh, with the Reformation that began in 1517. And that's some 1,500 years into the Catholic Church, right? So uh, what I find, and maybe some of you who were brought up as practicing Protestants, in my mind, it seems like a lot of Protestants think that the church only began with Martin Luther. But there was a, a 1,500 years prior to Martin Luther uh, and the Protestant Reformation that you can't just say, well, that was you know evil and wrong and all that. There was 1,500 years. So that's very important for us to understand. And then with the Reformation, then became all kinds of other reformations that took place, splintering the Protestant churches into various denominations. So does everybody understand this? This is just meant to help you to see the history of the church. Because for me as a Catholic priest and as a Catholic in general, the fact that Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church and that we have a 2,000 year history in union with the Orthodox, if you will, uh, that's critical for my embracing the Catholic Church. Why would I want to embrace a, a church that was founded in uh, opposition to the church that Jesus founded, or that somehow the church that Jesus founded wasn't good enough, and therefore we'll make it better by forming our own church. So that, for me, is one of the primary reasons I am Catholic and, and remain Catholic. Now, the other th handout that I want you to look at that's tied to this to a certain extent is, um, uh, let me see, where did I put it? There it is. Nope. Here it is. The Eastern Rites of the Catholic Church. Okay. As I mentioned, it was in uh, 1054 that the Great Schism occurred, where the Orthodox Church broke away from the Pope, okay, or no longer recognized the Pope as the head of the entire church. But there were some Orthodox churches that remained in union with us, okay, they did not break away from the Pope. And, but they weren't called Orthodox, they were called the Eastern Churches. Uh, they were part of the Church of the East. Some centuries later, like two or three centuries later after 1054, some of the Orthodox Churches that did break away from the Catholic Church returned to full union with the Catholic Church. Now the Eastern Church has its own spirituality and its own way of celebrating the Mass, what they would call the Divine Liturgy, and it's based on the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. If you go to the Orthodox Church down here, that's the liturgy that, that they celebrate. It's as valid as our Catholic Mass. Uh, those that returned to the full union of the Catholic Church two and three centuries after the Great Schism were allowed to maintain their history, their heritage, and their way of celebrating the sacraments. And those churches we call Eastern Rite Catholic Churches, the Eastern Rites of the Catholic Church. And there are several. There's the Maronite, Melkite, Chaldean, Romanian, Armenian, Italo-Albanian, Ruthenian, Greek Catholic, Ukrainian, and Russian. Except for the Maronite Church, which is at the very top, all these other churches that are in union with us have a branch that is not in union with us, that is Orthodox. Okay, So these would have been one church at one time, but there's a group of them now that don't acknowledge the Pope and a group that does. Does that make sense? Okay, and, and when you look at the history of the church, okay. So this is just for you to get a fuller understanding because most Roman Catholics, in this country anyway, are clueless about this aspect of the Catholic Church. Absolutely clueless. Uh, and, and, and so it's important that we have a sense of that. Okay. Now, what is the church? The church is the community of God's people, baptized, confirmed, and celebrating the Most Holy Eucharist or the Mass. This community celebrates their common faith in God. They worship God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the church is. So, you know, a lot of times when I was little, uh, Protestants would say, Catholics don't know what the church is. Catholics think that the church is the church building. And uh, really the church is the people of God, and not just the priest and the Vatican and the institutional part. It's all the people of God. And I always tell, told them, I said, well, we believe that the church is all the people of God too. So the church is all the people of God who are baptized. Uh, that makes them members of the church. And they are strengthened in being initiated into the church through the sacrament of confirmation. 
And then the sacrament of the Eucharist sustains their life in the Holy Spirit or in their church, in the church. Uh, so baptism you can only receive once, confirmation you can only receive once, but the Eucharist you can receive as often as possible uh, to sustain our life. So the church is uh, the people of God. The church is universal, Catholic, and the term Catholic for the church really began uh, with the fathers of the church in, I believe, the second century. Some, one of the early fathers of the church referred to the, cat, the church as Catholic, and I don't have Buck Milton here to tell me uh, who that uh, person was. There's our seminarian who should know more than me at this time because he has it fresh in his mind. Who was the father of the church that uh, first used the term Catholic in the uh, second century? Was it Justin Martyr? No. Ignatius of Antioch? Ignatius of Antioch, yes, you're right. It was Saint Ignatius of Antioch, that's right. Okay. And Catholic with a little c means what? Universal. Universal. Now, when he described the church as Catholic in the second century, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, who or what was the Catholic Church at that point? It was the Catholic Church, meaning uh, uh, the Pope, uh, the bishops in union with them, the East and the West. It was all the baptized people of God. There were not any Protestant branches at that point. Yes? 69. In the year 69. Is that when it said, oh, so it was the early, first century, actually. So it was, very, it was all, during apostolic times. Absolutely. So that's very important. Okay. So the Catholic Church is universal. It is visibly organized. It is worldwide, but it is also local. And by local, I mean like St. Joseph's Parish here in Macon, Georgia, Holy Spirit, uh, uh, St. Peter Claver, and the other parishes that we have in the diocese. The Church is also known as the Body of Christ, a single body with many parts. The Church is also supernatural. And that's the, if, if you don't get anything else out of what I say tonight, the supernatural aspect of the church is critical, the divinity of the church, if you will, because the church of Christ is the body of Christ, whose head is Christ, who is divine, whose body we are, okay? But we're united. It's one being, so to speak, if you will. So it's not just a human concoction or a sociological phenomenon uh, to bring people together to do good works and to pray. It's not like a country club, if you will. Uh, it is a community called by God to save sinners, okay? And the head of this community is the one divine being, Jesus Christ, who has two natures. And that divinity and humanity of Christ is imbued in the church. So there's a supernatural aspect to it that enables the church to continue throughout history until the Lord returns at the end of time to judge the living and the dead. So no matter how sinful the body of Christ might become in terms of the members of the church uh, and, and how corrupt we might become or how corrupt some of the institutional aspects of the church might become, the church will always survive because of its divinity, that supernatural element whereas country clubs normally don't, okay? <laughs> so, so, so does that make sense? Okay, okay. so that's most important, the, this divine aspect of the church. We're not just a human institution. We're both human and a divine institution. So the church is first and foremost a mystery or a sacrament, if you will. A sacrament being a reality imbued with the hidden presence of Jesus Christ. Now we don't mean that the church is a sacrament in the sense of one of the sacraments we celebrate, but a sign of the risen Lord, our life together as Catholics. The church is also the whole people of God. And all God's people are called to participate in the mission of the church. All people, not just priests and nuns in the Catholic Church or brothers or monks, are called to holiness. Now, holiness, I don't know, in your mind, what do you, what, let me ask this question. Um, what image is conjured up in your mind's eye when you hear the term holy, referring to a person? Sainted. But what does that mean, sainted? Virtuous. Virtuous, but what does that mean? I mean, what, what, what is the, the image that's conjured up in terms of, of, of humanity being holy? When 
I was little, I admit it wasn't me. Exactly. <laughs> but what was distasteful about the, the term holiness if it were to be applied to you? Or if somebody would come up to you and say, Charlie, you're a holy boy. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't like that, okay. Why? Why? Because I wasn't. Well, but, but, but what would make you, apart from not liking it as a teenager, oh, you're a holy teenager, what would make you embarrassed about that? It was a pejorative term when I was that age. And it would oh. connote somebody that was old, dour, and in church all the time, and didn't really have a real life. Yeah, wasn't with it. Okay, wasn't with it, okay. That's what I'm getting at. Most people think of holiness not necessarily negatively, but yes, they do think of it negatively uh, as something that, that is otherworldly, different, weird, but out of touch, uh, but they're in another world, so they are holy, okay? That's not what holiness is. Holiness is Jesus Christ, and he was anything but what we have just described, okay? He was, I don't know if he was the life of the party, but he liked to go to parties and dinners and things like that. Uh, he turned water into wine. You got to hand it to him there. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, you know, he went to, to eat in the homes of some of the most uh, uh, questionable people. Uh, and he liked to argue with people and we see him getting angry occasionally. So, so. Being holy doesn't mean that you're necessarily otherworldly and out of touch. It means that you uh, are embraced by the holiness of Jesus and are subsumed or subsumed into that holiness because really Jesus alone is holy or God is. We only share in that holiness. So you should think about Jesus in terms of holiness and then I think it will give you a more positive understanding of what it means for us to be called holy if we're imitating Christ. Yes. Sharing divine nature, but you know, he was a person of prayer, person of words, a person of action. He was an extrovert as far as we know, but he also was a contemplative. Uh, so, so there was both aspects of that. Is, is, is God coming back? No, what is that? <laughs> is, it, is it the second coming? No. Okay. okay. I hear music. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. So, the mission of the church includes uh, calling people to be Christ-like, which means holiness, okay? The mission of the church includes service to human needs in the social, the political, and the economic orders, as well as preaching the word of God and celebrating the sacraments. So, you know, a lot of people say, the church has no business in politics. Hello? Uh, you know, the church has every right not to tell people how to vote or what political party should belong to or what political philosophy is the best. But we have to bring our Christian teaching, our Catholic faith, and what we believe about morality to what is occurring in politics, uh, to what is occurring in government, uh, to what is occurring in the economy. Um, so, so it's not Christianity, Catholicism, and holiness is not a Sunday-only thing that happens in the confines of the church building and, and what committees of the church would consider to be important, like... Uh, um, the refreshments that we have before RCIA, uh, it, it's about the, the life that we live and bringing the faith of the church and our morals to the marketplace and challenging the marketplace, every aspect of it, uh, with those teachings. So the church sometimes can be controversial uh, when it deals with politics because what, is, what are the two things that you should avoid in any um, um, civil conversation? Religion and politics, okay, uh, so, so you know that, that any time we bring religion to politics, then there's going to be fireworks. But anyway, just be aware of that. So what are, are the sources that are used as a basis for uh, Catholic teaching? Well, the primary source is uh, the written source, which we call the Holy Bible, of course. And as Catholics, we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, this inspired message is called Revelation, and this revelation teaches us about God and who He is and who we are in relationship to Him. The Old and the New Testaments comprise the Bible. The New Testament offers us um, guidelines, if you will, maybe even commands, by which we should conduct our lives as Christians. 
It tells us how much God loves us, especially in his son Jesus, and we are offered a motive for responding in love to Jesus, and that motive or that uh, um, carrot that's dangled out in front of us, what is it? Salvation, Salvation and eternal life in heaven. So th th ultimately, uh, we want to be in union with Christ because there, after our death, we will experience eternal life. So you cannot separate Christianity from Jesus Christ, his passion on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, his death and resurrection for enabling, opening up the gates of heaven for sinners who needed to be forgiven and offer the opportunity of salvation. So heaven is critical, and the whole ministry of Jesus Christ not only publicly but currently through the church, is to bring people to heaven, okay? To an acknowledgement of their sins, to repentance, and to uh, making a firm purpose of, of amendment not to sin again, but also to do penance for our sins. Because someone has said, and let me say if I can remember it correctly, um, God's forgiveness is both merciful and just that he forgives our sins is merciful, but that he requires penance for those sins is justice. And the two walk hand in hand. Uh, so, so that's an important teaching uh, of the Catholic Church. A written and lived source for the teachings of the Catholic Church is what we call tradition with a capital T. Uh, before the New Testament was written, it was lived and preached by the apostles. Uh, they, these were people who believed in Jesus and followed him, obviously. Uh, and then eventually what was t taught publicly in an oral tradition was put into a written form, and we get what we call now the New Testament. But that whole process of the formation of the New Testament is a function of tradition. So tradition refers to the manner in which the church uh, understood and lived the faith. Tradition covers more areas than the New Testament alone, but the New Testament is the primary tradition of the Catholic Church. But there are other things that we do teach that you cannot find literally or directly uh, in either the New or Old Testament, but you can find figuratively and prefiguratively. For example, purgatory. You know, if, you, if a Protestant comes up and asks you, no in the Bible does there say there's a purgatory, because the word purgatory is not there, you can say absolutely correct, and nowhere in the New Testament will you find the word trinity. Okay, but we believe in the Holy Trinity, okay, because we deduce it from the scriptures that God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But is there a word, the most holy trinity in the Bible? No, okay. That is a later understanding of what the scriptures teach us about God. Well, purgatory would be in the same vein, that there is some need for purification at the time of death for us to be fully capable of entering the fullness of our redemption in heaven. And as I've said before, if I were to die tonight, uh, the Alan McDonald that stands before you right now is not perfect, okay? Uh, I ha harbor some grudges. I have some family issues where I'm really ticked off at some of my family members. Uh, and, and there have been others that have offended me, and I'm not sure I've fully been reconciled with them. Uh, the Father McDonald that stands before you right now cannot be this way if I'm in heaven, okay? Something has to happen from the moment, if I drop dead right now, from the moment that I drop dead and the moment that I find myself in the fullness of heaven that has purified me of any animosity that I have towards anyone, anyone that uh, has offended me or I've held grudges against, I can't be in heaven and maintain those things. Plus, Father McDonald right now is capable of sinning, even at this moment. But in heaven, I won't be. So something happens, right? And we call that purgatory. We don't know what or how it happens other than by the power and grace of God. Or how long it is. We can't, you know, heaven doesn't have time. Uh, it could be millions of years as far as we're concerned, but in heaven a million years is like a second. So uh, who, who knows? You know, we can't. Those are philosophical questions that I think you can think about. The church doesn't discourage, you know, trying to figure out all that, but uh, it doesn't have any specific teachers on, on that other than there's a purification. And that purification can be painful. After death? After death. You couldn't be in whatever, what, state of purgatory, mm -hmm. here. 
Well, I would say now, now there, this life is a purification as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Becoming a member of the church is a purification of the sinner, isn't it? So uh, penance is a purification. It's the road to holiness, yeah. So absolutely, I, I, believe, I believe also the dying process can be a purgatory. Uh, you know, especially on your deathbed if you're gasping for air and all that. The, I mean, that's going to make you need, no, recognize the need for your Savior, right? <laughs> you know? So I, no, I do believe that, that a lot of people's purgatory is in the here and now. And, and that's why they probably need less in the hereafter because they've done the majority of it here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Pardon? It should, yeah, because that's part of what suffering is, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Pardon? Very good, very good, okay. Yeah, question. Yes. Uh, sorry, where does the church stand on reincarnation? I mean, uh, the, the question is, where does the church stand on reincarnation? That is not a, a, Christ, a Jewish or a Christian belief. It's a belief of, of the more uh, Eastern religions like uh, Hinduism and all that. There is, uh, we would say it's heretical. Uh, to, to believe in reincarnation. Uh, could one possibly go through purgatory as becoming a, a priest or a nun and a new life to then be accepted into heaven? No, no, it's you. You go through it and, and who you are is purified. So you don't become something else or someone else or something else. So, so, so you are a unique person from the moment of your conception uh, that is thought of by God even before you're conceived and loved by God and the fullness of who you were intended to be by God is uh, fulfilled in heaven. And it's you, not somebody else or anything else. I'm not implying Okay, to yeah, that yeah. But, but that, that should be good news, though, uh, that you don't have to become something else or come back and, as somebody else because you weren't good enough who you were before. Uh, so if you were never good enough and totally rejected God, you go to hell. Uh, so that's the bad news. You can't come back as another person having to try. Uh, so, 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 so that's the most important thing. Okay. Um, for the sake of... Yes. Correct. Ernie. And gift, uh, salvation is a gift from God. Right. It's not you don't earn it. Okay. Yes. And not have to go to purgatory. Yes. And the church offers indulgences to help alleviate the need for, for purgatory. So, so it's, not, it's not essential purgatory, although it seems to me that most of us have to have something occur somewhere along the line that makes us perfect. Uh, so what that is is open for debate, you know. Okay. Yes? When I was coming up and, and was being taught by the nuns, I think we all viewed, the children all viewed purgatory as being Sort of like hell, but maybe not quite as bad. Correct. It wasn't going to last forever. I felt that way too. You're right. You're right. But I, I've read since then, uh, Scott Peck says in mm -hmm. some of his writings that if there is a purgatory, <clears throat> he hopes that it is like a state of the art psychiatric hospital <laughs> <laughs> to be made whole. Yes. I like that concept better. <laughs> <laughs> And that's possible, that sort of, um, what do you call it, um, reasoning is allowable because we don't have any strict teaching as to what purgatory is. We only have images that we've used from the Old Testament and New Testament of fire, but fire in the sense of being purifying, cleansing, not, a, not torture. Although sometimes um, treatment for an illness in it is painful, right? Uh, surgery is painful, you know, so, or, or whatever. So, so there is an element of suffering in this process of being made whole. I used to think maybe it's also religious education where you get to know who God is a little bit better doctrinally and all the rest of that. I don't know, but the church doesn't say it's religious education, but somehow in that process you come to know Jesus Christ in a very personal way, in a way that you never did prior. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yes. I read somewhere that uh, if you're in purgatory, that you can pray for yourself. You cannot pray for yourself. So Correct. If nobody else can pray for you, then you're going to stay in purgatory forever. Well, Jesus is interceding for you. So, uh, so that's the most important thing to keep in mind. So, but it is important to have others praying for you as well. So the church always prays for all the faithful departed. Uh, always. So, so there is always 
a prayer in the universal church for, for even though there might be not be individuals calling on you know a particular person in general so so you are being prayed for yeah definitely if you have turned away from God totally uh, throughout your life consciously and deliberately and you should have known better then you've kind of condemned yourself to hell you God let you go in the direction that you were going in to begin with uh, purgatory is for those people that are saved and have been saved uh, but need purification or justice as well. Justice needs to be meted out as well. Mercy and justice. Okay? Yes? I want to it's the reconciling of the eternal truth and love. Correct. In other words, the sin is the opposite of love. Correct. It's the void of love that you come to know love more perfectly. Mm -hmm. more perfectly. And I think the, the whole dogma of purgatory is very um, appealing to most people. That, that, that God ultimately will do all in his power to make us one with him. And so I think it's a, it's a very hopeful uh, doc doctrine, if you will. Now, for the sake of common practice and order in the Catholic Church, the Church has compiled a summary of laws and guidelines, which is called the Code of Canon Law, or Church Law. The Code of Canon Law guides the Church in terms of marriage, what is expected in the sacrament of marriage, the training of priests, the celebration of the sacraments. Church law helps the Church to live by scripture and tradition. So there is a Church law based upon divine law to keep holy the Lord's Day by going to Mass uh, and on holy days of obligation. And there are certain laws that govern, you know, marriage and annulments and all the rest of that. Now, church law has two components to it. It can include divine and natural law. And if it's divine, if it's based purely upon divine and natural law, it cannot change, okay? But there are some church laws that are purely human laws uh, uh, developed by the church for the sake of order in the community. For example, that we should do penance on Fridays every Friday of the year in observance of Jesus' crucifixion is a church law. And the penance that we once had was that we should uh, abstain from all meat, poultry, and meat products every Friday of the year. That is a church human law that can be changed by the church. Okay, But a divine law like uh, uh, procreation is part of the uh, human sexual intercourse and therefore should not be eliminated by artificial contraception, that's not a human law. That's based upon natural law, which is divine. Does everybody understand the distinction there? Okay. Natural law is based on the order of creation and what God intended for creation and his created order, uh, and therefore it's divine. So some canon law would incorporate elements of natural law as well as divine law that's in the scripture. But there would be other laws uh, that would be purely man-made for the sake of the community. Okay? But we should respect all of the laws, whether they're man-made or not, because God gave authority to the church and her bishops, the Pope also, to establish these laws for the sake of our life together as Catholics. So the mission of the church is to proclaim Jesus Christ in his message. The life of Jesus and his message uh, is what the church has to make known to the entire world, to go out to the whole world with the good news, even if they don't want to hear it. Uh, and we should not proselytize those who belong to other religions, but we should at least not compromise what we believe and say that all religions are alike. Uh, we just say, this is what we believe, and you're invited to consider it. Uh, but we don't force conversion, so to speak, or try to put down others' beliefs in order to put forth ours. Now, you can have a nice, healthy debate with people if they're willing to do that, and certainly you are expected to tell them what you believe. So as a Catholic, if I'm debating uh, with a Jew and he wants to know what I believe, I'm going to say, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Jewish expectations. That's what we believe as Catholics. And, uh, and you are only saved through Jesus Christ. Does that mean that Jews are going to go to hell? No. Uh, but if anybody's in heaven, whether it's a Jew or Hindu or whoever, it's because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his death and resurrection. I'm going to say that. 
uh, if I'm asked. Okay. Now I'm not going to go into the Jewish synagogue on interfaith Thanksgiving service and offend every Jew that's out there by uh, saying you have to convert and be saved or you're going to go to hell. That would be wrong. Okay. But if I'm in uh, uh, an environment where they're expecting me to teach what or to explain what we believe, then I would give that teaching. Okay. Does that make sense on that? Okay. So you should respect people in that regard. The church, <laughs> with its mission, is realized and expressed at the local level as well as the universal level, as I meant. The church, uh, local and universal, embraces more than the Catholic Church. It is the whole body of Christ, which includes Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Anglicans or, or Episcopalians, and all of the various Protestant denominations. Now, let me make that clear. The church includes not just the Roman Catholic Church, but Orthodox, Anglicans, or Episcopalians, Lutherans, Methodists, and all the various other Protestant denominations that there are. However, the church that Jesus Christ founded is the Catholic Church, and those that, for whatever reason, have broken away from us still are part of the church, but not in full communion. Okay? Now, that's a distinction that you might think is like splitting hairs, but it's not. Uh, uh, you know, the, that they have, if, you if I'm a Catholic today and I decide to become a Baptist tomorrow, I'm not going to add anything to what I believe as a Christian by becoming a Baptist. In fact, I'm going to have to start stripping away some things. Does that make sense? Uh, the same thing is true if I become a Lutheran or an Episcopalian. I will not add anything to what I already believe as a, a Christian, but I'm going to have to remove some things that I believe as a Catholic in order to become a Lutheran or an Episcopalian. Does that make sense? So you understand. So, but Episcopalians and Lutherans and all are part of the church, but they have, in effect, um, separated themselves from the complete fullness of truth that the Catholic Church contains, and the Orthodox Church contains. So, so that's a, an important distinction there. Now, at one time, prior to the Second Vatican Council, which ended in 1965, we would have said that all Orthodox and Catholic, uh, Christians who are not Catholic are not Christian, and they're going to hell, okay? And if you wanted to become a Catholic, we would rebaptize you. I'm not sure about the Orthodox Church, but, but with the Protestant churches, we, you would have been rebaptized at the Easter Vigil. So the Catholic Church has officially on an institutional level has come to a newer understanding of the Protestant churches that broke away from us in the 1500s because that caused a lot of animosity. Just like in your own family, if you have a very strong family member that does something and then separates from you and then tells you you're all wrong and bad and all the rest of that, that's not going to create good feelings. Uh, so, uh, so we had that baggage with us for the last 500 years, but the Second Vatican Council kind of moved the Catholic Church into a new position in regards to current day Protestants who are very committed to their faith, not in opposition to the Catholic Church, but because they're committed to their faith. There's a difference there, right? Okay, so that's very important, and we recognize that, and the goodwill that is there, and the good works uh, that Protestants do. Um, and the same thing is true with Protestant churches. I think they've moved in a more positive manner with us also, and no longer are they criticizing us for what we were in the 1500s. Uh, they're looking at us who we are today, and that gives them a different perspective also. Okay. So in summary, the mission of the, uh, of the whole church is one of proclaiming the word of God, celebrating the sacraments, and witnessing to the gospel through a lifestyle that is marked by humility, compassion, and a respect for human life. It should be one of service to the needs of both those inside the church as well as outside the Catholic Church. I can remember um, when I was first ordained, we had a, in the parish that I was there a, a ministry called Neighbors in Need. And the parish supported it rather heavily, kind of like family advancement ministry, but it had more of a, a food and uh, handing out of food and you know, paying electrical bills and all that. And there was a rather big budget for it. And the majority of people that we were assisting were not Catholics. I mean, there were people from all over the place. And there were some in the church saying, well, why are we helping all these people when we should be helping ourselves? 
And really the mission of the church is not just to us, it's to the entire uh, community, and especially those uh, in need, and that we minister to them in hopes of evangelizing them, but not because we expect them to become Catholic. We minister to them because they're a creature of God and loved by God, and, and that's an important component to keep in mind. So how is the church organized? Well, first of all, all baptized Christians are called to share in the mission of the church. And in the Catholic Church, and you wouldn't be familiar with this, but up until the Second Vatican Council and somewhat afterwards, most Catholics felt that, that it really was the job of the priests, the sisters, and the uh, brothers to be the evangelist and be holy and represent them. And all they had to do was come to church on Sunday, support the church, and follow church teaching. But they weren't called to take an active role in like becoming missionaries or, or a variety of things that are associated with the church. And there's been a big change in the Catholic mentality about that in the last 40 years. Yes? So we call it clericalism, right? Correct. But it was institutionalized at that point. Uh, uh, and the Second Vatican Council kind of called the entire church to recognize that even though there's a distinction of roles in the church, we all are called to holiness and we all have a mission. Now for the lay person, which we'll talk about in a second, it's usually in the realm of the secular world uh, that you should bring your Catholic faith to your politics, to your workplace, if you're a manager, to how you uh, manage your companies and treat your employees and uh, all the rest of that. Uh, but, and we'll get into that in a second. So how is the church organized? Well, there are two main groupings in the church. The first grouping are the laity. The laity are all the baptized who have not been ordained a deacon, priest, or a bishop, or those who belong to a recognized religious order of the church, like a brother or a sister. So the laity are the most important, so to speak, because you would not have priests, bishops, and the pope if not for the laity who gave birth to them, okay? So this other handout that I gave you, with the, uh, the pyramid on the top and a very terrible um, drawing of Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> the church is a hierarchy, okay? The Catholic Church is a hierarchy. Now, we have it in the form of a triangle because the triangle also represents the Holy Trinity, okay? Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you can't keep the mix of the Holy Trinity out of what the church is. But at the top of the pyramid is the Pope, who is the head of the universal church, what we call the pontiff or the bridge builder for the church to God, uh, also the supreme pastor. There are numbers of titles for the Pope, but he's also ultimately a bishop. He's the Bishop of Rome. He's the successor of St. Peter, who was the first uh, head of, he, he was the head of the apostles because Jesus Christ made him so uh, during his public ministry. Then you have the bishops who are the successors of the other apostles, and they all have an authority in and of themselves to teach, rule, and sanctify. Then you have priests who assist local bishops in ministering to the church and administering the church. You have deacons who are ordained as well to assist priests and the bishop in his role. Then you have religious. The term religious in the Catholic Church means, it could mean a, a, what you would normally think it would mean, but it also refers to people who are consecrate, live consecrated vows. Nuns, monks, sisters, and brothers. So if you hear a Catholic or a priest say, the religious, it means them, okay? So uh, it, it's just another way to define that term. It also, religious means, you know, you're who you are as a religious person. Um, and in the Catholic Church, in terms of nuns and monks, they really are a different category of religious than sisters and brothers. Although you would call a nun a sister and you'd call a monk a brother, those who are in solemn vows and live a monastic life are truly what we would call nuns and monks. Those who live a consecrated life but active in the world as teachers, nurses, and social workers, and all the rest of that, they are not technically nuns or monks, but they are sisters and brothers. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's a, a monastic uh, view of how you would live out your consecrated vows versus a more active view. Now, the more active type of sister or brother evolved out of monastic and contemplative communities. So the first consecrated were those who did live in the monasteries 
and these monastic communities, both men and women, and lived a life separate and dedicated exclusively to prayer. But many religious said, well, we need to be helping the poor and teaching the ignorant and nursing the sick. So it was at that point uh, that some of these people separated themselves from the monastic way of doing it to a more active lifestyle. And, and in the church, there's a tension between those two ways of expressing religi religious life. Now, up until about 1965, the dress or the habit of a brother or a sister or a monk or a nun was identical. And it came from monastic times when you lived in the monastery and you didn't have to teach and, and work out in the field and all that. So you had these long habits that dragged the ground and uh, all the other accoutrements. Well, after 1965, there was a, a greater awareness that the active nuns should be more like the laity in dress and, and lifestyle. And so there was a development <coughs> away from a more monastic way of doing things that has caused tension in our Catholic Church. And it continues to exist uh, to this day. And in fact, Pope Benedict has asked for an investigation of, of the more active communities in the church to make sure that they haven't gone off the deep end and embraced uh, too much of a secular approach uh, to living out their lives where they kind of neglect uh, the religious purpose of their life together. Does everybody understand uh, that now? And there has been a terrible decline in brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church since 1965. I mean, drastic. And the ones who have remained are now in their 70s and 80s, a very few younger ones. So the Pope is concerned that eventually uh, there may not be any. Now, we don't need them. They're not essential. No, I shouldn't say we don't need them. They're not essential to the life of the church. And if they disappeared, the church would continue on. But they have been such a gift to the church for centuries, we would hate to see that happen. And so does the Pope. So he's kind of asking them to address issues in their community that has led to their decline and fall. Not all of them are declining and falling, but a good number of them are. And that's always happened in the history of the church. Uh, some, you know, sprout up and do very well and then fall. But there's been a, an unusual across-the-board decline and fall of these orders, and that's why the church is concerned about it. Now, the other category that I have here of, of, to look at Christ, uh, of the church is to look at the church as the body of Christ rather than a hierarchical under, uh, or, or pyramidical, pyramidical uh, understanding, to look at the church as the body of Christ, where Christ is the head and the body itself, arms, legs, eyes, all the rest of it, uh, is the pope, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, the religious, and the laity. And overlaid on all of this is the institutional aspects of the church, what we believe as Catholics, uh, to be divinely revealed by God and to be believed by Catholics. So that's very important. Yes? Um. I, I don't see on here some of the, the, the terms I've heard being here in other places. Uh, uh, monsignors, uh, cardinals, what are there like specific titles? Very good. Like yes. Titles? Yes. Uh, he, he says, uh, asked me the question about the titles that we have for some who are in the church, like uh, abbot, abbess, monsignor, cardinal, um, what are other titles? Archbishop. Uh, those are honorary titles, uh, and, but they're not distinct from the, the ordained. They're just honors given to them, and they're man-made. Uh, so some bishops choose not to elevate bishop. Uh, some bishops choose not to name their priests monsignors because they feel that it might create friction among those that don't get named monsignors, and uh, and who deserve it? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't get me started on this. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, a cardinal does have an important role in the church apart from a monsignor. A cardinal is the means by which the church has determined through human law uh, that the pope is elected. They, we could come up with a different method that would not need cardinals. Uh, but we, the Catholic Church basically sticks with its traditions and doesn't change easily, even with man-made traditions. Uh, cardinals, so, bishops. Cardinals or bishops, cardinals. usually. Not always, though. Cardinal Avery Dulles, who died six or eight years ago, was a Jesuit priest and never ordained a bishop. Now, he was a different level of cardinal. He could not go to the conclave and elect the next pope. Uh, so that, that would be only for cardinals who are bishops or archbishops, usually they're archbishops. No. Okay. So any question on my, my drawings here? It's just a visual to help you to understand uh, the church. And do not report me to anybody about how I drew Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. 
So, th so the first group obviously is the laity. The second group uh, is the clergy. By clergy, we mean deacons, priests, and bishops. Religious brothers and sisters technically are not clergy, but oftentimes people view them within the category of clergy or more official in the church. The laity have a specific calling in the church of spreading the mission of Christ where they live and work. They are to be witnesses to the Catholic faith in the marketplace, not only by what they say, but more importantly by what they do and how they live out the Catholic faith. So, so this is where the Second Vatican Council was very explicit. It taught that the laity have a role and an obligation to bring their faith to the place where they spend the majority of their time, including their politics and their job and a variety of other places. And I would say that this has been the area where we have had the greatest scandal in, since the Second Vatican Council of people in the laity who have not done that. And I'm thinking of the Kennedys, and I'm thinking of pro-choice politicians who claim to be Catholic. I'm thinking of any Catholic who opposes the Catholic faith by what they do in the marketplace. And that is opposed to the Second Vatican Council. There is no way to get around it. Uh, and so, so what I'm saying is, my job as a priest, the bishop's job as a bishop, the deacon's job as a deacon, is to encourage the laity in their role in the world. But I shouldn't have to get up in the pulpit and say that so-and-so, who is pro-choice and, and trying to run for governor or president, and he's a Catholic, uh, shouldn't be doing that. And Catholics shouldn't be electing him, you know. Uh, but Catholics, if they understood their Catholicism, it wouldn't be necessary for me to get up there in the pulpit and say that. Does that make sense? But unfortunately, we're in a period of church history where there's a lot of confusion about uh, uh, roles and, and what is expected. But it's very clear. It's just that there's some confusion. So the laity also serve the church uh, in the liturgy as readers of the scriptures, ushers, choir members, altar servers, extraordinary ministers of commun communion. They obviously teach religion uh, in our schools and in our religious education programs. They can be administrators. Uh, they can be youth directors. Uh, so even here at St. Joseph's, you know, in the traditional Catholic parish prior to the Second Vatican Council, you would have had the priest, the pastor, with maybe two or three associate priests, and they did it all. You might have had a secretary and a cook for the priest and the parish, and that was it, and a bookkeeper. The laity usually were not hired to become youth directors, although there might have been volunteers to coordinate that. They wouldn't have been hired to be administrators, like I have Steve Mestrangelo here, and you wouldn't have had lay people as directors of religious education. A nun would have been that. Um, and in the school, you would have had the principal as a nun and all the teachers as nuns when we had an abundance of them. But since the Second Vatican Council, now the laity are taking more of a role in these ministries, including being principals of our Catholic schools and the teachers that we have in the schools. So is there any question about what the laity are called to do in the churchified uh, mission of the church? I would say that that is important, but it's secondary to what the laity should be doing out in the world. Okay? Really, the churchified stuff is more for the clergy and a few people that we hire to help us. They're far from being the majority of the Catholics in the world. The majority of Catholics, their role is in, in the world. Okay? Um, as members of the people of God, the laity have a right to speak and to be heard within church structures. And so since the Second Vatican Council, we form pastoral councils. They don't have the same authority as, let's say, a vestry committee does uh, on, in the Episcopal Church or, or the Board of Deacons in the Baptist Church. They don't have that kind of authority, but they assist me in making decisions. But I ultimately have the ultimate decision-making process as a priest because that's the hierarchical order of things. I also have a finance council where I have experts, hopefully, that uh, help me to uh, 
uh, with the money in the parish, investments, and, and that we're doing things properly, and, and there's checks and balances and all the rest of that. Uh, we have different committees to make sure that we're doing what we should be doing as a parish community. So it doesn't all hinge on the priest that we have a lot of people uh, helping us. The clergy, what is the role of the clergy? The clergy, meaning uh, bishops, priests, and deacons, uh, and the bishop in particular now, in carrying out the church's mission, the early church established an order in ministry. The apostles held a special position of honor and respect among Christians of the early church. The apostles exercised leadership within the church, and after the resurrection of Jesus, others joined them in this leadership. Men were chosen to succeed the apostles and to act as bishops. Uh, the ceremony for handing on the power uh, uh, of the role of the, the apostles to a man is called the laying on of hands, or ordination, or consecration. The bishops are the official teachers of the faith. They are united with other Catholic bishops under the Pope, who is the Bishop of Rome. The bishop is, a chief, is the chief shepherd or pastor of a large geographical area called the diocese. And within the diocese, there may be many parishes which are uh, which are served by ordained priests and deacons. Larger dioceses are called archdioceses, or archdioceses, and have what is called an archbishop, but an archbishop is still a bishop. He just has a little bit more authority because of the responsibility he has in a larger diocese. Every bishop is ordained for the whole church. The visible head of the Catholic Church is the Pope who represents Jesus Christ, visibly. He appoints bishops, but the bishop's authority comes from God. The entire community of bishops, along with the Pope, is called the College of Bishops. So the role of the bishop is quite literally to teach, to rule the Catholic community, and to sanctify, uh, to celebrate the sacraments, to proclaim the word, and to make sure the mission of the church is carried out. And he has helpers, like priests and deacons, who assist him in that ministry. In fact, we can say a diocese that is headed by a bishop is really what we might call a megachurch. You, know, uh, you know, you talk about these evangelical Protestant churches that are megachurches. If you look at these megachurches that sometimes have 25 and 30,000 members, if you look at them closely, they're, they're kind of organized uh, similar to our dioceses uh, with other people who you know, lead smaller groups and all the rest of that. Uh, and then they just come together for worship on Sunday. Well, the diocese is kind of like that. The bishop is the pastor of the, of the first megachurch that's ever developed. Uh, and, and he has branches so that it can be broken into smaller, more manageable groups called parishes and religious communities, uh, so on and so forth. Some bishops uh, have an honorary title of cardinal, and they help select the pope and assist the bishop in the administration of the universal church. So is there any question on bishops before I talk about the pope in particular? Okay. Well, how did the op office of the papacy or the pope develop? The Catholic Church honors St. Peter as the first pope, leader of the first apostles, and he was designated as such by Jesus Christ. The Gospels portray uh, St. Peter as having a special role upon the apostles, and uh, amongst the apostles, I should say, and you should read Matthew chapter 16 to understand that. Also, the Acts of the Apostles show that the other apostles accepted the leadership of St. Peter. The Catholic Church accepts the Bishop of Rome as the true successor of the Apostle St. Peter. He is Christ's representative on earth and also called the Vicar of Christ. So is there any question on, on the authority of the Pope uh, and where it comes from, and that he is infallible in the areas of faith and morals, but he can't make up teachings. It has to be based on scripture and tradition and have been believed during apostolic times if he names something to be infallible, like the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary or the Immaculate Conception. Uh, for example, many people think that it is not an infallible teaching that only men can be ordained priests. They think it's just a culturally based thing. But Pope John Paul II said, no, that's part of the ordinary magisterium of the church, meaning the ordinary teachings of the church that is not explicit but assumed or presumed because it has been a 2,000-year tradition, and our teachings tell us that the role of the bishop and priest at Mass is to, be, to act in the person of Christ, showing forth his bridegroom status to the church, which is the bride. 
uh, of Christ. So uh, he says that he has no authority, the Pope did at that time, to change that or to adapt it, which means that there are limits to papal infallibility. He can't just willy-nilly change something because there is a, a, a fad within culture uh, that says that uh, women should have equal rights in all things. Uh, not a fad, but a trend in culture. And that's not bad that women should have equal rights in certain things, but there are certain things that, are, that we cannot change when they relate to uh, faith and morals of the church. Okay? Uh, others would say that uh, the Pope should relax uh, the teaching on uh, contraception. The Pope said he can't do that. It's based on natural law. He has no authority to change natural law. Okay? Uh, so his infallibility is limited. Uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Is there any question on uh, infallibility? Okay. Now we're getting close to time, so I'm not going to go over everything else that I wanted to, but I, other than I'll say that the Catholic Church, now, now the priest, the ordained priest, shares with the bishop in the ministry of the church, but I can't do everything a bishop does. Only a bishop can do certain things. And the deacon assists the priest and the bishop, but he has a unique role, but he can't do everything. He can't hear confessions, he can't celebrate Mass. He can baptize and witness marriages and, and do ministry. Uh, so that's important. The church is also what we call one holy Catholic and apostolic. The church is one because of her source, the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and because of our founder, who is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. And the church is holy because the church unfailingly uh, is holy because Jesus, who is with the Father and the Spirit, is hailed as alone holy and loved the church as his bride, giving himself up for her to sanctify her. So the church is sanctified by Christ. In her members, perfect holiness is yet to be acquired. So when I talk about the church universal, the institutional church, the church is the body of Christ, it is holy because it is part of Christ. But each one of us is not yet perfect, and within us there are sinners, as well as saints, scoundrels, as well as, as very good people. So, so we recognize that certain members of the church, even in the clergy, uh, can be a source of, of unholiness, if you will, and, and, and you know, thwart some of the activities of the church. But the church in general is holy because of who Christ is. The church is Catholic, as we also already mentioned, because it's universal. Uh, and it has been sent out by Jesus Christ for a mission to the entire world. So, so the Catholic Church is not just for a select few people. It is for everybody, because Jesus Christ came to save everyone, not just some. And the church's mission is to make that known and to gather as many people into the community of salvation as possible. The church is apostolic because it is uh, founded on the apostles in three ways. She remains, and, and we also refer to the church in the feminine. She was and remains built on the foundation of the apostles. With the help of the Holy Spirit dwelling in her, she hands on the teachings that she has heard from the apostles. And thirdly, she continues to, to be taught, sanctified, and guided by the apostles and their successors until Christ returns uh, at the end of time. So, any questions on any of that before we go to our questions uh, on the table? Yes. I think most Protestants are used to their churches calling a pastor, but in the Catholic Church, is it really more that the bishop chooses who goes to be a priest in a church? Correct. That's a good question. Um, most Protestant churches are very, not all of them, but are very congregational, especially Baptist uh, uh, in this part of the country. So each Baptist congregation is kind of like a diocese in and of itself. So they call their own pastor, ordain people, and all the rest of that. Uh, whereas in the Catholic Church, to be called to the priesthood, you have to, first of all, have a feeling that God is calling you, but then the bishop has to call you after an examination of the person, whether they're qualified to be ordained and have the proper education for that. So you have to have both. Uh, uh, the, the, the individual wanting to be a, a priest but the church wanting that individual to be a priest. Both together have to go hand in hand. Um, in terms of the pope, uh, the pope is the one who assigns bishops, names bishops. But names are given to him, recommendations are given to him. So Bishop Bolin in our diocese was named bishop of this diocese by um, Pope John Paul II. Uh, 
uh, and the successor to Bishop Bowen will be named, God willing, by Pope Benedict if he's still living at that time. Uh, but there's that's kind of what we call a human tradition. There could be other ways to name bishops where the people are more involved in that, and, and there is a, a case for that in history. Uh, and, and different countries, too, have different ways of forwarding names to the Pope. Uh, but ultimately, the Pope demands that he has the ultimate say, even though he might ratify what somebody has elected uh, as a bishop. So does that answer your question? Okay. But, but normally the bishops assign pastors? Correct. In, our, in the Catholic Church, or the, Saint jo if I were to resign or as pastor, St. Joseph would not then call a new pastor. Bishop Bolin would name a new pastor. Now, the Bishop Bolin might come here and say, well, what would you like in a new pastor? And people would say, anything that is different than Father McDonald. Okay. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but, so he might take it, but he doesn't have to do that. Some bishops do kind of come and try to, you know, see what the needs are. And I think they do try hard to match a priest to the, the congregation or the parish that's being, that he's sending them to. So the congregation has no authority whatsoever to call the, the, the priest or to fire him or to remove him. Only the, the bishop can do that. Okay? Yes? That just, it just, it just confuses me because I understand the Pope himself can appoint bishops. Now, uh, unfortunately, when a, when a Pope you know, passes on, it's up to other bishops to elect bishops for the Bishop of Rome. Correct. Bishop. Correct. And so do they have like a handful of names or do they just say, hey, that guy? It's go? kind of a, a mystery. We would say that probably now the cardinals of the Catholic Church are norm. It does not have to be this, but this is the tradition for several hundred years. Normally, cardinals are the ones that become a pope. So the car current cardinals that we have now probably are looking at one another and saying, would, is there anybody among us now that would be a good successor to, Saint, uh, to uh, Pope Benedict? Um, so they're probably already thinking about that. Uh, and then when they get, after the pope dies, when they go into what's called a conclave, they're, the cardinals that are going to be, are there, and there's somebody in their midst that will be named the next pope through an election process. Okay, like um, majority it's the majority. I can't remember what the uh, I think it's two thirds or something like that. I'm not sure what the the, the thing is. Uh, so they're the ones that uh, will elect the pope, and it's usually from their rank. So they'll know who it is that they're electing, and there could be some politics involved. Now I don't know that uh, uh, somebody actually would want to become a pope. I think they'd have to have their head examined, uh, you know, for wanting to be a pope because it's just it's it's you're just so, you know, uh, removed uh, and you lose control of your life totally uh, when you become pope. So, but there are some that would want to to be a pope, uh, but they're I think looking at administrative abilities, teaching abilities, intellect, and uh, holiness, and maybe holiness should have come first. But uh, but if you have a, a pope that's monastic or overly intellectual and not capable of relating to people, that may not be a good thing for the church. So they're looking at a variety of things. Uh, so there would be some politicking, I think. And it's probably going on now for the next successor. Is it okay? true that any man in the Catholic Church, even an unordained yes. priest, can be... Technically, according to church law, any man in the Catholic Church who is not married or is willing to give up his wife which is a lot, and uh, <laughs> could be named uh, the Pope. Uh, the Pope. Uh, and what happens is, let's, and this has happened in the early history of the papacy, what happens is if that occurs, then the, the person is ordained a priest, ordained a bishop, and then uh, installed as the Pope. Um, so it all happens together, okay? Yes? I mean, we, as a people of faith, we believe the Holy Spirit is Correct. Right. This is a supernatural process Even as well as a human. Man, we believe the Holy Spirit. Right. The, the, and, and Pope John Paul, I mean, people were totally surprised. That yeah, he was yeah. And it's quite possible the next pope might come from an archbishop of the church that's not a cardinal. That won't even be in the conclave. And they'll have to call him at his rectory or, and say, well, you've just been elected pope. <laughs> so, can you imagine? <laughs> at least, you, at least you're there if you're a cardinal and you know what's happening. You know, <laughs> you don't get a phone call. You know, so, so, so. 
Not recent, recent, not modern times, no, no, not ever. Not, I think the early church, maybe up until the 6th century, you might have had those things occurring, 6th and 7th century. I just really don't understand the, the, the role of, of the Pope other than seeing his, his photos. And oh, well, that's a good question. His role is to teach the Catholic faith to an entire world. Okay, So he has a very public role to teach the Catholic faith to establish discipline in the church, to regulate how the Mass is celebrated, uh, to reform areas of the church that needs to be reformed, uh, to put forth and clarify teachings in the church when there are questions around those, uh, to name bishops. That's one of the most important things he does because that's where you're touched on the local level by the Pope. So Pope John Paul II was actively involved in this diocese of Savannah when he named Bishop Boland to be the bishop. Okay? Yes? Correct. Yes. So there are different groups throughout the world that go and meet the Pope every five years. Bishops uh, do. So the, the Pope has a lot of authority in the Catholic Church, a tremendous amount of authority. In fact, I would say that there's no other human being on earth that has the same amount of authority invested in his role as the Pope does, not even a dictator. And the point of unity, right, in the Catholic Church, right. I mean, there's always disputes, right? Right. I mean, there's always, you know, amongst dip, even amongst bishops and yeah. cardinals. Right. Well, and, and so who is the point in the person? Mm -hmm. Right. He's the one that says what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. Okay. Really, he is. He's the final authority. And I have always said, especially in, we've had lots of controversies in the church for the last 40 years. And my belief as a lay person and as a Catholic is, I'm sticking with the Pope Amen. no matter what. Amen. No matter what. Amen. You know, I'm not joining a splinter group. I'm going to stick with the Pope. And I think that's the source of unity, and that's the role right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm yes. sorry, I know we can go mm -hmm. all, all night, but real fast. Uh, as, as, a, as an American, I, I, I value our freedom, and I, I take part of every election I, that I can. Mm -hmm. Having said that, that's why I'm kind of, I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that a group of what would you say a hundred people, hundred cardinals elect the Pope to represent millions or billions of, of Catholics around the world? I mean, it's just well, we would say as Catholics that this is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So it's not just a human activity. It's not a country club. And how do they uh, get there? How do they get there? Yeah, how do they get to be cardinal? All that whole yeah. Uh, so you cannot discount the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this. In fact, we would say that it's the Holy Spirit that selects the Pope, but acting through the Cardinals. So there's a supernatural element there, or, or divine element. Yeah. You, you know, when we talk about this it, as a convert, to me, it, beforehand, mm -hmm. as I was joining the Catholic Church, it, it blew my mind, the fact that somebody, a preacher, could get up and really give a very good teaching or service that really challenged his parish, or well, not his, you know, his church, and the people not like it, and he's out of a job on Monday. That's not going to happen in the Catholic Church, you know. If I'm teaching the truth, if I teach heresy, then the, the Pope yes. would come and yeah, the not bishop, the Pope, the Bishop yeah. would remove me. Right. You know? So, so the, the the difficulty there in terms of if you were just voting because of on popularity, well, we need to hear the truth, you know, even if we don't like it, and that's one of the advantages here, it, you know. And there are disadvantages, too. It's now, if you look at Protestantism in this community of Macon, Georgia, not so much like Methodists and Episcopalians and uh, Presbyterians, but the others, every time there is a major controversy in their local church, somebody comes forward and breaks away, and they form another church. Now, Macon, Georgia is supposed to have the highest capita of churches of any community in the United States. In the United States. Yeah. And there are still churches being formed in storefronts. Yeah. Uh, and I'm asking... Huh? Well, you know, we have enough, folks. Uh, you don't need any more church buildings. Uh, so, so, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think you, you, have, you know, the church recognizes democracy as a good thing. But the church will not be a democratic institution. Right. Because Jesus didn't, you know, ask people to vote whether he should get up on the cross or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, our ultimate right. authority. You know, you could take that triangle and you could turn this upside down and say the Pope is supposed to be the ultimate servant, just as Christ was. To hold up the church, right. right. Mm -hmm. 
Carter. And that's what and that's what we, we're supposed to view it. We tend to think in terms of an authoritarian, but really it's the, the hierarchy is more and more servant is really what it's supposed to be all about. Mm -hmm.